Good morning. Blessed be God who calls us together. Praise be God who makes us one people. Blessed be God who has forgiven our sin. Praise be God who gives hope and freedom. Blessed be God whose word is proclaimed. Praise be God who is revealed as love. Blessed be God who alone has called us. We offer all that we are and all that we shall become. Receive, O God, our sacrifice of thanks and praise. Accept, Accept our thanks for all you have done. Our hands were empty, and you filled them. And now from Psalm 25, 1 through 10. Lord, I give myself to you. I trust, I trust you, God. Do not fail me, nor let my enemies float. No one loyal is shamed. But the traitors no disgrace. Teach me how to live. Lord, show me the way. Steer me toward your truth. You, my saving God. You, my constant hope. Recall your tenderness, your lasting love. Remember me, not my faults, the sins of my youth, to show your goodness, God. Remember me. Good and just is the Lord, guiding those who stray. God leads the poor, pointing out the path. Give praise to the Father Almighty, to the Son, Jesus Christ the Lord, to the Spirit who dwells in our hearts, both now and forever. Amen. Merciful God, you continually show us your ways of forgiveness and steadfast love. Remember not our sins, but recall your compassion to your children. Satisfy the longing of your people. And fulfill all our hopes for eternal peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen.
a timely question, who is your neighbor? Or who is the one who showed mercy? And we hold a prayer, all those engaged in summer travels, as well as those who are in need of healing. Special welcome to guests. And welcome those who worship with us via the live stream or on YouTube, especially those of you in Alaska. We know you're checking up on us. And we're all here and no one played hooky because you were gone. So it's all good. Um, and we welcome Oliver back from Philly, where he marched in the uh, Independence Day Parade for this week. And then he's going to disappear again. So again, welcome to worship. Welcome to Christ. Uh, I'd like to invite the kids of the kingdom forward for the kids' word. And if I count it right, there's four of you that are willing to... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to save those for later, and then I'm going to, I'm going to use them. So, Colin, uh, we're going to act out the story of the Good Samaritan. So I need you. I'm going to be the guy that gets beat up. And so you just lay down here on the, on the floor like this, like you were beat up. And I sit up here. And you sit up there. All right. There's Colin. So here we are, and first of all, there was a religious, a religious leader, and that would be me. And he walking along, and he sees Colin beat up on the side of the road, and he says, ah, I'm busy. <laughs> and then there was someone called a Levite, which was a helper of the religious leaders, and you be the Levite, so you walk by the you 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 ignore him too. All right, and then I would like Norman and Melvin to be the Good Samaritans. What what does the Samaritans do? They sit on the chair. They can sit on the chair. Samaritans were people that. Other people turned their noses up because they were from a different country. And so they like didn't Canada? like them. Yeah, like Canada. <laughs> so, no, in Canada. In Canada, yeah. They didn't like them because they were not from their land. So they thought that they weren't very good for nothing. But what happens when the Good Samaritan sees Colin beat up? What do they do? They help him out, right? So will you give him some medicine? Yeah, pretend like Kyle, you can pretend like those are medicine. Okay. <laughs> and then can you can you wrap him up in your blanket? Yeah. Can I two more medicine? Oh, two more medicine, that's good. And then can can you like pretend like he's got an owie and fix his owie? Okay, that's good. That's good. And then can you pretend like he needs something to drink? Good. All right, now we need to take him to the hospital. So can you pick him up? Okay. Okay, and we're going to take him to the hospital. Now, the question for you is, who was the better neighbor to Colin? Was it the, the pastor or Edda or the person who gave medicine? It was the Madison guy, you're right. You're right. So to be a good neighbor means what? What do good neighbors do? Um, they say hello. They say hello? I That's have right. a better one. And they do what? Um, they be nice. They be nice to each other and they, help, help, help out their neighbor. One of them was mine. One of them was yours. Yep, you shared yours. That's very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming up. Thank you. For being the victim. I'm ready to watch the rest of this show. <laughs> Our first reading is from Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 9 through 14. The Lord your God will make you abundantly prosperous in all your undertakings in the fruit of your body, in the fruit of your livestock, and in the fruit of your soil. For the Lord will again take delight in prospering you, 
just as he delighted in prospering your ancestors, when you obey the Lord your God by observing his commandments and decrees that are written in this book of the law, because you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Surely this commandment that I am commanding you today is not too hard for you, nor is it too far away. It is not in heaven that you should say, Who will go up to heaven for us and get it for us, so that we may hear it and observe it? Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will cross to the other side of the sea for us and get it for us, so that we may hear it and observe it? No, the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart for you to observe. Praise to Christ the word. Amen. Speak to God. Our second reading is from Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Paul begins his letter to the Colossians. From Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. To the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. In our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. You have heard of this hope before in the word of the truth the gospel that has come to you, just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, so that it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it, and truly comprehended the grace of God. This you learn from Ephraim, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power. And may you be prepared to endure everything with patience, while joyfully giving thanks to the Father, who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has res rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Praise to Christ the Word. Amen. Thanks be to God. Long ago, God spoke to his ancestors, in many and various ways by the prophets. But now in these last days, God has spoken to us by the Son. his wounds, and having poured oil and wine in them, then he put on 
put him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and I, when I come back, I will repay you for whatever more you spend. So which of these three, do you think, was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the lawyer said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, Go and do likewise. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. So we all know the story of the Good Samaritan. You see it it's on the reading. Your eyes roll back. You say, oh, I can nap through this one. I know this one. <laughs> and that's the problem. Is it's just a little too familiar. As soon as you hear the story, the a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He said, oh yeah, I can do that. But let's hear the story again. Imagine the wandering Jesus. You know, we've established that he is heading, his face set toward Jerusalem. Coming down to Judea, the southern kingdom, was planning and stopping at the home of his three old friends and family, Mary and Martha, and their brother Lazarus. He'll be there next week. They live in Bethany, which is the second suburb out on the east side of Jerusalem. And on the way there to see his friends, Jesus stops by the synagogue. And the congregation is crowding in this little synagogue building. It has a door, much like ours, that opens onto the highway. That is the highway that goes from Jerusalem down to Jericho. A dirt road by our standard from the Dead Sea and the Jordan River up through the little town of Jericho right up through Bethany and Bethphage and finally into the big city of Jerusalem up is the operating word for this road Jerusalem sits on a rocky hill 2700 feet above sea level Jericho is down in the Jordan Rift Valley on a river plain about 840 feet below sea level. Remember that the Jordan dumps into the Dead Sea, which is the lowest place on Earth. But maybe we can imagine it be like upstream of the Minnesota River and traveling down 169 and downstream into the River Valley. That road is about 12 or 15 miles between Jerusalem and Jericho. But in the course of 12 or 15 miles has a change in elevation of over 3,500 feet. Most of it obviously is rocky and hilly and uninhabited desert terrain. It's always been a refuge for those seeking to avoid the crowds of the big city or living in the city or the authorities in the city, hermits, John the Baptist, Jesus in the wilderness, outlaw, thieves, monks, anybody who wants to live off the grid, that's where they're headed. I can remember stopping when I travel on that road a few miles outside of Jericho to get our pictures taken on the sign that marks the sea level when you're going below sea level on the edge of the road. When I was there, that sign was about the only thing on that road, even to this day, save an Israeli army caravans, uh, observation points for looking over the valley into the country of Jordan, one medieval monastery, medieval monastery and an old Jerusalem police post that some entrepreneur in Israeli had renamed the end of the Good Shepherd and opened a gift shop. There are no trees, no significant vegetation the whole way. Jericho with its palm trees and sycamores really does look like an oasis down in the valley along the river. We can imagine that people from that wilderness region where John had grown up and Jesus had fasted and been tempted loved to shoot the breeze, though. Rough frontier types, they were an argumentative lot. No doubt had heard about this carpenter from the Galilee, had worsted some in debate of their best theologians and professors around. And they sensed a good show to come as they gathered in the little synagogue to hear what this Galilean would have to say in his sermon this day, this northerner. 
to get things going. A doctor of the law stood up to talk to Jesus the rabbi. He was picked by the others to be their spokesperson and to challenge the visiting teacher. He was a doctor of jurisprudence, a first-rate law school in Palestine, maybe he added in the law review, picked up a PhD in humanities along the way, and he had a question for Jesus, the visiting preacher. And the visit, when Jesus the, called on him, he said, so, uh, teacher, uh, what must one do to inherit eternal life? And in good pedagogical, educational teaching, Jesus, the good teacher, responds to a question with a question. He went right back at him. Well, you're the lawyer. What does it say in the law? How do you read it? And working to manipulate the flow of the argument to his advantage, the lawyer counters, well, master, which is the first commandment of all then? And Jesus says, the first commandment of all is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. Apparently, this simple exchange of questions and answers for lawyer and teacher had a lot of technical meaning for the intellectuals in the crowd. So the lawyer had to ask a follow-up, just to poke at him, show him how much he knew. He asked a dangerous legal question. What he was getting at really was whether the prohibitions in the law, 365 specific ones, together with 248 positive statements and commands in the law were to be all regarded as equal value and importance. That's what the lawyer was trying to trick Jesus up with. To get him into trouble with the authorities, the Pharisees and the Orthodox police. And without question, Jesus gave a reply that simplified a person's duty to their God and to humanity. Love God, love your neighbor. Quoting from the law of Moses and Deuteronomy and Leviticus, as well as from the Israelis equivalent of the Lord's Prayer, the Shema, if they say twice a day, he went right back to the fundamentals. This law he distinguished from the 600 or so other laws, the trivial human invented ones which the Pharisees were intent on keeping themselves and enforcing for everyone else to keep, to keep them all too busy pay attention to what the Pharisees were up to, lining their pockets, playing for power. It's the kind of assault and authority that got Jesus killed. On these two commandments, Jesus said, depend all the law and the prophets. The lawyer is not done yet. He says, well, teacher, you have said in truth that there is one God and there is no other beside this one. The Lord your God is one and that your God should be loved with a whole heart and your whole understanding and your whole soul and your whole strength and to love one's neighbors of yourself is greater than all temple sacrifices and offerings. Jesus nods, but his eyes study the guy, wondering what he's getting at. You're not far from the kingdom of God, Jesus says. You've answered right. Do this and you will live. Jesus said, you tell him, get on with it. Now you know what to do. Do it. The lawyer, unwilling to be disposed of so easily to impress his lawyer friends around him, enters the fray again. He has another question. He says, well, who is my lawyer? And through careful manipulation, now he has led the way up to this dilemma. Does neighbor mean only my fellow Jew, Jesus? The people who are like me? You certainly can't mean that a Gentile could be my neighbor, or an occupying Roman, or one of those heretical Samaritans, for God's sake. Certainly you mean to say that my neighbor, the one who is like me, the one with whom I like, or the one with whom I'm comfortable. Perhaps the lawyer wanted from Jesus a, a legal definition of neighbor, so he could refer to it in a case of loving a neighbor, if it ever happened to come up in court. Maybe he wanted to hear something on the order of, 
A neighbor, here it after referred to as the party of the first part, is to be construed as meaning a person of Jewish descent whose legal residence is within a radius of no more than three statute miles from one's legal residence, within the radius of no more than, uh, unless that person is an, another Jewish descendant, hereafter referred to as the party of the second part, living closer to the party of the first part than the first one, in which case the party of the second part is construed as a neighbor to the party of the first part, and one is to consider yourself relieved of all responsibility if that neighbor is closer to you. <laughs> the lawyer is trying to get the discussion back into safe territory. The discussion need not involving being a neighbor, but only defining a neighbor. We'll just talk about who your neighbors are. An academic exploration can happen. The lawyer, his own lifestyle, no exempt from scrutiny, can do brilliantly in the ensuing exchange. It's the kind of terrain on which lawyers excel. The whole concept of neighborliness can be developed into a symposium and a research project, and we can create a foundation. We could print papers and publish them and make some money, and I could edit them myself, he thinks, and contributors could add to a second volume, and we could make sure they get tenure and rather than their neighbors. Jesus cuts right through all that crap. He refuses to play academic games. What does Jesus do? He tells a story. Luke has Jesus tell a story. As we will see, the truth in this telling is that my neighbor at any instant is the one that God has brought here to me and put in my path. The person who I become close to through serving in need, even if that person is a stranger or an enemy. A, a neighbor is not a person who lives near us or is like us. Being a neighbor involves action for Jesus and for Jesus' followers, your neighbor is to be anyone who needs you. Listen to what follows. In the midst of this carefully crafted, academically proper debate with the lawyer, Jesus tells a story, and there's certainly no better way to put down a PhD than to tell a story. A story, the lawyer thinks. For God's sake, I thought we were going to have a stimulating intellectual discussion about neighborliness. And he tells a worthless story. What an undignified thing for this rabbi to do. Even so, the lawyer has to stand in the midst of the congregation and listen, because he asked the question. So if he wants to know Jesus' answer, he'll have to see what kind of definition he can extract from the story himself. Where Jesus sat, at the head of the aisle of the synagogue, he could look down the aisle, and through the open door, and out onto the Road beyond, the Jericho Road, Highway 19, 169, that robber-infested highway, you remember? It was as if he were describing a drama that he could be sitting there looking out the synagogue door and seeing unfolding before him there on the road. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves. Situation they all recognized immediately, but they mostly feared. And under the storyteller's spell, their imaginations go to work. They could see a certain person packing their bags for the journey. They could all immediately identify with the journeyer because they'd all been there. They'd all packed their bags. They'd all traveled that road. They, they'd all been afraid of what might come off from around the next bend or, bend or the next rock. Now think for a moment when you heard the story about who the first person you identified with. For me, or most of us, it's the Good Samaritan. We think, oh, yeah, I'd be that person. I'd be the one to offer help. It's probably not the journeyer. But those first people who heard that story would not have identified with the outcast, the Samaritan. They would have had personal experience as the journeyer. To understand the context of the story, we have to put ourselves in the place of the journey. This identified, unidentified person, who's not necessarily male in the Greek, was walking down Highway 19 or Old 169 one night or Hennepin Avenue on the way a bunch of troublemakers from, say, Jacobi or 
Minnetonka. We're cruising in the family Beamer, trying to get some excitement, and grabbed a person's wallet and beat him up and left him there in the ditch half dead. Now by chance, there was a Lutheran pastor going down the same street. When he saw the person, he crosses over into the far lane since he's already late for the food shelf meeting. And then an executive vice president of a Twin Cities social service agency, when she comes to the place and so on, she crosses over to the other side too. She was collecting her thoughts for a speech she was going to give on remedies for juvenile delinquency that she was about to give at a prayer luncheon. Then comes the University of Minnesota student. Maybe they have dreadlocks, maybe they have tattoos. Maybe they're from Iraq or Russia or an African American from North Minneapolis or maybe they're HIV positive or Somali or Latino or Muslim or feminist or labor union leader or your nemesis in country government, county government or homosexual or your ex-wife or a capitalist picks whatever one that offends you the most and you will recreate the anger that Jesus hears felt when Jesus said that the person who came along and helped was a Samaritan. His verbal twist he said this Samaritan whoever drove by she came to the place where the traveler lay. She had compassion. Took the first aid kit from the glove compartment, stopped her minivan, and tried to bind up and soak the journeyer's wounds. Are you still identifying with the victim, the journeyer? Binding up your wounds? Then she put the wounded one in the back of the car, getting blood all over the upholstery, and drove to the trauma hospital. And since the victim had no insurance card, no ID, no wallet, the hospital wouldn't admit this bloody one without a financially liable sponsor. So the lady took out her purse and gave the admitting clerk her credit card and said, just take care of this person, please. We can settle the account when I return tomorrow. And so we have the good Russian or the good Iraqi or the good resident of North Minneapolis or the good HEV part of the person or the good homosexual or the good capitalist or the good communist or the good Somali or the good feminist. Does the shock value of the story begin to register for you as it did for Jesus' ears? We like to identify with the Samaritan, but in the context of the story, it's not possible. And we know the background, the only person that we can see ourselves as is the wounded one. And recognize the one who comes to our aid in our hour of need is the one we most despise. The notion that those people we despise would come to our aid at the hour of our need, emerging from the story as moral, morally superior to a Lutheran pastor or a head of a social service agency is shocking to us. A good flippant Samaritan to Jesus hears too, it was unthinkable. And here for a moment Jesus pauses to look at the blank faces of the people and then straight at the heckling lawyer is still standing there. And he poses an entirely different question. It's not the abstract, who is my neighbor, that the lawyer asks. But now the concrete question, which one of these three, in your opinion, proved to be the neighbor to the one who fell among robbers? Who is the outcast who serves you? Looking back into the smiling face of our Lord, the lawyer could only answer uh, uh, the one, uh, you know, uh, the, the you know the, the one who showed mercy. He couldn't even bring himself to say the Samaritan, let alone the good Samaritan. But that's what he meant. Poor lawyer. He sought to entrap Jesus. But in the end, it was Jesus who entrapped him. What else could he have applied to Jesus' question? He must have known with a sinking feeling that the circle of entrapment was complete. For now, what can 
Jesus possibly reply to him except now go and act the same way yourself. Now just go do it. Jesus has destroyed the abstract head trick, demolished the academic thinking and the practical action seeking foot trick has begun. It's not wise to tangle with Jesus, even if you have a PhD or a JD. The lawyer's response is left unrecorded.
Let us pray together. Blessed are you, God of all creation. Through your goodness we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Blessed be God forever. Amen. that we bear the fruit of your healing mercy to a broken world. Turn us toward neighbors in need. Bring aid and support to those who are poor, beaten down, abused, forgotten, silenced, silenced or avoided. Especially we bless the relief, mission, and hunger ministries we support and all who are traveling. Hear our prayer, O God of grace. Your mercy endures forever. You created the earth with seeds sprouting up to new life. We pray for the flourishing of fruit trees and orchards, vines and bushes, fields and livestock. Prosper the work of those who plant, tend, harvest, and gather. Hear our prayer, O oh God. Your mercy endures forever. Show us your ways and teach us your paths of justice and love. Raise up community and national leaders to challenge the broken systems in our world. Give them courage to bring an end to practices that perpetuate ethnic, racial, and religious profiling and discrimination. Hear our prayer, O oh God of grace. Your mercy endures forever. Come near to all in need. Orchestrate kindness in the face of cruelty. Hope where there is despair. Love in the face of neglect. Comfort where there is death and healing and illness. Especially, we pray for healing for Amy, David, and Mary. Hear our prayer, O God of grace. Your mercy endures forever. We give thanks for the saints who revealed your love and mercy in this life. Inspired by their witness, strengthen us to live in hope and comfort all who grieve. Hear our prayer, O oh God of grace. Your, your mercy endures forever. O Lord God, your mercy delights us, and the world longs for your loving care. Hear the cries of everyone in need. Turn our hearts to love our neighbors with the love of your Son, Jesus Christ. Receive all these our prayers, merciful God, and dwell in us richly through the same Jesus Christ and the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. As Jesus teaches, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. And speak to God. God said, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. The earth is the Lord's, and all that is in it. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen.
fit, so we'll just stand here before we go. <laughs> Welcome to worship. Thanks to those who served as leaders this morning, to Lisa and to Oliver and to Amy and to whoever brought flowers. They're beautiful. Um, again, after worship, if you want to check how your data came in to our uh, migration into the new church management tool, you can check out with that. Sign up for summer ministries, especially helping out with VBS and with the food shelf on the 21st. We can use workers in the morning and the afternoon, also that same day as congregation council meeting, or for mowing and trimming and reading and serving communion and all those other things. Anything else for the good of the many? Twins uh, game. Twins game. Twins game? Yep. Sign up now. Nah, last chance, probably. I'm on. I think time to get the tickets. <laughs> All right. Then go on out to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have a great week.